Um, thank you. This is actually probably twice as many people as I thought I would get um, for a now CEO uh, talking about a low-level messaging system. Um, here's some info about me, um, where you can find stuff about uh, what I've done, um, and not especially on GitHub repo. But you know, why should you even listen to me? Whoop, I need to actually. There we go. That's better. That's the information. And then, why should you even listen to me? And the answer is you probably should be. Right? Most of uh, the company that I work at now, they want me to keep away from the keyboard as much as possible. Um, but in a prior life, I spent about six years at Google. Prior to that, I spent about uh, 12 years or so at a company called Tipco, which uh, just got privately sold that most people don't know about, but in the late 80s and early 90s, it kind of revolutionized the way Wall Street works. And a lot of the technologies that I built there, uh, in terms of rendezvous and EMS, still run in Wall Street. So trade distribution, quote distribution, back-end trading, um, and selling stuff, so still running mostly on uh, rendezvous and EMS. Um, matter of fact, we were at a customer the other day, they threw up 600 EMS servers, um, which is kind of interesting. I also architected uh, Cloud Foundry when I was at VMware before we moved to Pivotal. And essentially, I've been building messaging systems and solutions for over 20 years. So um, I usually get it right. Not always, but I usually get it right. So why messaging? A little bit of background. I'm sure if you've had uh, any talk around Docker, you've also heard of microservices. Right? Mark microservices architectures. And it's, Essentially, the notion that software systems are being decomposed into smaller and smaller parts. And that trend is going to continue, right? So that you have a very purposely built small pieces of, of code that can be lifecycle managed independently. They have to figure out how to talk and, and coordinate amongst um, everybody else. And what's interesting is, is that when I was at Google, uh, from 03 to 09, we had a massive explosion of the number of things that were answering uh, basic Google query. So in 1999, a Google query touched about 12 computers. In 2009, I think it was about 10 to 11,000 computers. Uh, and I would guess right now you're getting close to 100,000 computers. So when you search for the Oscars on Google and hit enter, you're actually touching a massive amount of machines. And how those machines actually coordinate, talk to each other, um, is usually based on some level of communication protocol. Event-driven architectures, which is uh, I'm a big fan of. Um, and HTTP, which I actually love. As an interface, though, it only goes so far. It's usually point to point. It's good for moving large pieces of data around. There's also the notion of one in and one of one of n patterns, meaning I want to talk to a whole bunch of people, or I want to talk to one person, but I don't know which person that is. And it might be a whole large n. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, cascading request and reply, the notion that I want to create a request and it might ping pong between five or six different elements before I actually get the answer back. And then subject or, or topic based routing. So a different level of routing protocols versus uh, IP report. So this is a fun stuff. Again, I'm, I think people call me experienced now, not old, but um, in terms of a network recap, we still, we have IP, we have TCP and UDP, right? So we have this notion of streaming versus limited packet size and unreliability with UDP. The first version of Rendezvous actually used UDP, and then I built the current generation of what was called the TRDP, which is the Technicron Reliable Data Grant Protocol. Um, and what we were trying to do there is effective one to n, right? So we wanted to be able to say effectively, I want to send it out to 100 people, and I don't have to send it 100 times. And at the time, that made the most sense. When we were doing this code, clear out multicast didn't even exist. Um, now, multicast obviously came um, on board. We were actually involved in that. I don't know, does anyone even know multicast? Yes? Anyone use multicast? Interesting. That's surprising. The, um, when we were doing all this work at Tipco, TechFront slash Tipco, what was interesting is that we had access to a lot of the network elements. We could actually see what was going on inside of there in terms of the kernels that were inside of those. In the late 90s, right, with the explosion of the internet, the World Wide Web, something very interesting happened. Inside of a network element, there's a fast path and there's a slow path. And what happened was that TCP was the only, you know, child, so to speak, in the fast path anymore. 
UDP, broadcast, UDP, point to point, multicast, all was outside of it. And that was kind of a response to the internet, right? Everything was TCP, IP, HTTP, of course, on top of that. My you know, multicast essentially failed, right? The administration of it was problematic. It became difficult to use. Matter of fact, in my understanding, and I don't know this for sure, but I understand a lot of running with customers have actually gone back to the reliable UDP uh, protocols and not multicast. Multicast, for the most part, is to be trumped or totally disallowed in any type of cloud platform. And UDP, in most cloud platforms, is trumped, if it's even allowed at all, at the top of the rack switch. You can't actually use it now to do anything. And what's interesting is that for certain types of N, um, probably, depending on your message size, 30 or so or less, it actually is faster to send it 30 times from one point, which is kind of uh, non-intuitive. So in terms of, of messaging, this will probably be a recap. Everyone's going to laugh at it, but I just want to make sure we're all level set. There's basic messaging patterns around publish, subscribe, queuing, and request reply. Publish, subscribe is you send it to a topic or a subject, and anyone who's interested in it can actually see it. We're going to do kind of a live demo uh, in a little while um, with Nats, and you guys can kind of see what that means. But the cool part about why it was actually put together was was very, very interesting, and I'll talk about that in a second. Queuing is a general mechanism by which you have N receivers, but every message only goes to one of them. Like, this is not rocket science. It's not really exciting or sexy. But there's very, very interesting, distinct um, differences between what I mean by distributed queuing and what a lot of people <coughs> think queuing should be. Request to reply is I ask a question, I get an answer. And if you're only asking one person, right, you just use TCP, right, with some stuff on top of it. If you're asking a whole bunch of people, let's say they're forming queue groups and you're getting one, you know, response, a lot of messaging platforms do that as well. What's interesting, and it's a pattern that I use all the time, and it's one of the things that I built into the ads on day one, which we'll talk about, is what happens if you're asking a question, I'm actually going to ask every single person in the audience, and all I want is the best and first answer that I can get. There's massive ramifications on messaging systems, infrastructure, and the client libraries when you do that. I'll give you an example of why you would want to do that. Google search is really fast. And the basic premise of why it's fast is that they divvy up the corpus of the web right, into shards, and then each shard is replicated. So each time you hit something in Google, each shard is actually sending it to every single one of you, the fastest one back it uses, and it wants to throw away all the other ones. From what I remember, it could be different now inside of Google, it would just chop the connections after it got the first answer. But if you take a typical messaging library, right, a JMS type of thing, or a RabbitMQ, or something like that, you go, I'm going to ask a question. I have no clue how many people are out there, and I want the answer. If you look at the CPU load of your client library that's going to the request, you're going to see massive spikes all day long, right? They're literally appropriated to how many responders are out there in the network which you shouldn't care about. I shouldn't care if there's one of you, 10 of you, 10,000 of you. So we'll talk a little bit more about you know, um, a priority pruning of an interest route, which is what uh, Matt's can do. So some of the use cases, uh, and again, I've been building um, solutions on top of messaging systems for, for quite a long time, but this kind of captures what we actually do with them, right? Addressing and discovery. Uh, a really funny sidebar that uh, everyone kind of get a kick out of is, is that um, I was very fortunate in the early 90s to actually talk to Steve Jobs directly when he was at Next. And he wanted to embed Tipco's rendezvous into the Next Step boxes. And the CEO of, of Tipco said, I want you to do this and don't talk tech to him. Right? Don't talk about pub sub and all this other stuff. So I kind of remember saying something like, um, well, Steve, it's a way to have location transparency, discover, and utilize services in any platform. He said, great, I'll pay you a million dollars a lifetime. I said, no, we can't do that. And he said, you waste my time and you walk out. So that was my you know, five, ten minutes with Steve Jobs. Why it's an interesting story is that when Steve went back to Apple, they created a protocol called Rendezvous. And its description was location transparency where you can you know, transparently find and discover services. And I said, hey, that's not right. He said, I don't care. And he was probably right, but they did change it to Bonjour. 
So that's what the bond door service is. You can do command and control, a control plane, and that's what we use it for a lot in our system. So Cloud Foundry use it as a control plane. And Apsera, the company I'm with now, we use it as a secure control plane as well. But it can do load balancing, invoice scalability, location transparency as we talked about, and fault tolerance. So why Pub Sub? So Back and Brandon eBay actually described this to me when we were starting to build the first version of Rendezvous. He said, it's a radio versus a phone call. And the reason that Wall Street cared about this was, if I actually give you the quote of IBM, and I keep walking along, right, and giving everybody the quote of IBM, by the time I get to him, your version of the world is old. And we were all starting to start to see this notion of programmatic trading, which meant that you had a fair advantage over him, right, because I could have given it to you first. And so the notion was, how do we actually do quote distribution where it's fair, right? And one of the first reasons that we actually went down, published, subscribe, and reliable UDP was to make it fair. There's actually massive embargoes and stuff in terms of fairness. You know, obviously we can't change the speed of light, but that was kind of one of the original reasons that it actually existed. One of my big things is like, I always say, don't assume the audience. When you send a message, don't assume who's going to actually be watching it or looking at it, right? And I've seen it time and time again where, of course, when you're building the first part of the system, you're like, I'm sending a request and I need you to respond to it. But later on, it's like, well, hey, what if we want to measure something? What if we want to log this thing? What if we actually want to do X, Y, and Z? And a lot of messaging systems kind of go, oops, you can't do that. Especially if you do what's called published based queuing, which we'll talk about in a second. So queuing. Now, this is the interesting part. And again, this is kind of geeking out, and I might lose some people, but it's really important to me. Um, is it a publisher or a, sub a subscribe operation? Now, most people in the audience probably understand queuing as a publish op you know, operation. It's kind of like you get into the line at McDonald's and then everybody kind of goes to the right first line. And that's comp side theory. And that's when you send a message, you stick it physically into a queue, and then people are pulling off of the queue. A subscribe operation is very different. Right? Subscribe is what I call distributed queuing. And essentially, it only takes that part of you know, one member of the queue group is going to respond to any given message. It's, it's, it's subtle, but it's actually extremely uh, important, at least again. So request reply. Again, don't assume the audience. That's what we talked about with the Google example. I don't know how many people I'm asking uh, you know, the question of. Um, how many responders? I shouldn't care. The system should actually auto-adjust everything around that. And for me, it's always built on Publish subscribe. So the way NAT actually does request a reply is it creates an ephemeral unique subject, it subscribes to it, it sends the message out with that as a reply, and then when you reply, I'm the only one kind of listening to it. But if someone comes in the system and says, I want to see all the traffic in the system, right? We have all cards and, and, and subjects and topics, they can, they all see not only the request, but the response. A lot of systems you see the request, you can't see the response whatsoever. So these are some of the enterprise messaging patterns. You know, we've got persistence, store and forward, distributed transactions, which is, that was a really gnarly one. And then enhanced delivery models. And what I mean by delivery models is, at most once, at least once, and exactly once. Anyone have heard of those delivery models? Does that ring a bell at all? Okay. What NAS does is at most once. It's a fire and forget type of system. I actually designed and built an exactly one system for several financial clients, and they're very, very hard, if you're going to do it correctly. So the first time we delivered this system to the client, they're like, OK, great. They go to spin it up, and the system gets halfway spun up, and it sees a printout saying, system not supported and shut down. And they go, well, what the heck? You know, what are you doing? And I said, do you realize that for exactly once to manage, I have to have transactional semantics on my own, and if I can't tell, if your hard drive has cache enabled and doesn't have a capacitor big enough to spin the you know bits into the disk, SSDs and things like that, then I can't support you. And they're like, what do you mean? You know, we actually eventually went with a NetApp with 16 gig, which was massive at the time, of NV RAM and all this other stuff. It's actually not needed in my opinion. Exactly once is a problem that doesn't really need a solution. Right? There's other ways to do it, in my opinion. So what if we look at the problem differently. You know, should messaging systems do everything under the sun? 
stored for persistent storage, distributed transactions, transactions, you know, multiple delivery models. <laughs> and I've built those systems. You know, EMS has every single thing you just listed. And I think it's, you know, it's still a, a closed source uh, per pay product from, from TIPCO. But my understanding is it's one of the largest revenue generators still to this day. And it was, you know, done right with myself and an amazing team there. But when I was looking at what I thought modern distributed platforms would need going forward, I did find myself saying distributed transactions, persistence, you know, exactly what semantics. So it should it just do much, much less? And a lot of people will need to say, well, wait a minute, I want it to store and make sure that it gets delivered and all this other stuff. And the first thing I ask is, they say, who really cares who gets delivered? It's a hard question to go about if you start thinking about use cases, right? Your messaging server could blow up. So what happens when it blows up? What do you do? Why can't you do that in the endpoint, necessarily? Now, there is a notion of I'm going to queue something up, and later on we'll do batch processing. And I believe that type of storm forward model and pattern works. But a lot of times, it's almost an anti-pattern to expect that once I get it to the messaging system, it's going to take care of everything, because it simply won't. So, so much for the background. So that's, you know, got I.O. So the inspiration. Now, this is corny, and I admit it's corny, but it means a lot to me, which is I started looking at, you know, these distributed systems becoming larger and larger, more moving pieces, and trying to figure out how they're coordinating. I'm like, well, you know, again, it's corny. You know, how does the brain do it? Brain doesn't store and forward. It doesn't do distributed transactions. It doesn't do, um, you know, exactly one semantics. It's a fire and forget model. It really is. The neurons in your brain are firing, and they fire once, and they, you know, spray and pray, right? They hope. Um, so, for me, that inspiration started to drive what we actually designed in terms of that. And so. Not like Brendan, uh, but I try to be as close as I can uh, on a regular basis. I love high performance. I spent a tremendous amount of time in the TIPCO days squeezing every ounce I possibly could out of Ron and Boo and EMS. Um, and that's just a simpler way, it's just I'm older, I didn't have enough time, and I don't like writing in C anymore, although it's still my, my favorite language, I just can't do it. It's always on and available. It's kind of like a dial tone. And that's very different, because if you look at enterprise messaging systems, they are actually predicated on the fact that they're going to try to do everything possible for the client when the client asks them to do something really, really weird. Meaning that they'll actually take everybody offline because they're trying to do this thing. The queue's getting you know, a million messages, and we're running out of disk space, and we're in swap hell, and we're doing this. NAS doesn't do that at all. NAS version of the world is I protect myself at all costs, and I always have to be available. Extremely lightweight. Um, you know, if you need 450 dependencies to app get installed, to run your Erlang VM, and it's coming up and it takes up 200 meg when you first boot it up, that's not going to work. We talked about it, it's fire and forget. I mean, that most once. It's fundamentally built on PubSub, and that's it. Now, there's, there's notions of queuing and request reply that we'll talk about, but underneath the covers is a PubSub engine with an extremely high performance routing uh, mechanism to actually route between uh, subjects and be very intelligent around cluster semantics. It does have distributed queuing. So, you know, if all of us were responders and we all said, we're going to listen to Foo, and then a couple of us said, we're going to listen to Foo, and we're going to join a group called Bar, the publisher would send the message once, and the system is actually saying, okay, everybody in the Bar group, one person gets it. Everybody else who's direct, you know, pumps up, they all get it. There's another group in the background that, you know, they're called the BAS group, one of them gets it. And you can scale this as much as you want. And again, don't assume what your what, what the purpose of the message is. Um, and again, the request reply. But my version of request reply is, yes, it's a traditional one. I'm going to ask one person, I want one answer. But moreover, the pattern that we use a lot, I've used it in distributed sketching algorithms that, that actually you can actually see is I want to ask everybody and I want to get the very first best answer. And it's a pattern, again, I use over and over again. It's a pattern that Google uses to make Google search fast. In ours, uh, you know, both in the original Cloud Foundry and then AppSera's continuum platform, uh, we use it for our service sketching algorithm. So I literally say, hey, I got this thing to run. I'm going to ask everybody. And what's really interesting is, is that the first person back wins. And 
and the beauty of a, an algorithm like this to make it drop dead simple is, is that everybody does two things in the audience. They decide whether or not they can or can't run it, and if they can't, they just ignore it. If they can run it, they actually just determine how long they're going to wait before they respond based on things like memory pressure, where you're already running that job, right? So there's a development factor. Um, and it's drop dead dumb. Yet it looks extremely intelligent when we actually visualize it at scale in terms of how things are actually moving around. And so we wanted to make sure that NAPS was actually uh, highly tuned for that, right? You need to have these massive CPU spikes. So what is it not? It's not an enterprise messaging system. It doesn't have persistence. It doesn't have transactions. It doesn't have any advanced delivery models. And it's really not a queuing product, per se. It's not a store and forward mechanism. Right? It does have queuing delivery semantics of one uh, group. But it doesn't have this notion to put something here, hold on to it, and make sure someone actually consumes it. It's trivial to build that functionality on top of it, but NAPS as a core level nervous system does not do that. So it's kind of interesting to me that I'm even here. Um, when I built it, everyone kind of looked at it and said, well, we're going to you know, popularize this thing. And I said, trust me, nobody will want to use this except me. I built it strictly for myself to originally power cloud but that was it. Um, now what's interesting is, is that as mind shifts and cultures have changed, you're starting to see people wanting to build distributed cloud platforms or distributed systems without using traditional enterprise network messaging systems. Some are just using HTTP, some are using some of the protobuf stuff, um, kind of Google, um, some use Rabbit, although Rabbit's kind of still heavy in kind of enterprise messaging type system. Um, but I really did build it for myself, so it um, doesn't hurt my feelings if you say you don't want to use it uh, at all. Now, what's unique about it? Uh, it's a clustered mode server. Uh, anyone know full match one out versus directed asynchronous graph semantics? Um, EMS, which was built in Rendezvous, actually supported both modes. A directed asynchronous graph, you can kind of just hop, but you can't make a cycle. Full mesh one out is if you have two, they're talking to each other. If you have three, they're all talking to each other. Uh, NAS is a full mesh one hop clustering mechanism. The clients are cluster aware. Irregardless of support from TNS or IP load balancing or anything, you can literally give a client a pool of servers, say, here you go, and then it'll actually randomly figure out which one to connect to. If that one dies, it automatically reconnects instantaneously to, to the next one. We've got a decent amount of clients, Go, Node.js, Java, Sala, Python, Ruby. We're going to be adding a couple there um, in, in the futures. Um, it does the auto pruning of the interest graph, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, it's always pub sub, it makes no assumptions. It does do distributed queuing across clusters, which early in the days of EMS, I couldn't figure out how to do. Um, they figured out how to do it, and I think I do it a different way. Um, but the mechanism of, of the first release of EMS was you have to know where your queue group was, which server it was attached to, and you'd have to attach to that server. In that, you can attach to any server you want. You know, if we could have a thousand servers, everyone's attached to a different one, and you guys could all be part of the R group, and it just works. Um, and it's a text-based protocol. You know, everything I've designed in my career was always high performance, bin packing, all this other stuff, you know, figuring out little Indian versus big Indian, Light word boundaries and all kinds of just stuff that will push you to sleep. Um, a good friend of mine created a system called Redis, and Redis is actually text based. And him and I were talking about it. Um, and I said, computers are so fast, I don't think text based matters anymore. And, and that's actually the truth, it doesn't matter anymore. So, performance, again, not as good as Brendan, but I, I try, at least, you know, uh, at least as best I can these days. Um, NAS was originally written to support Cloud Foundry. It's still in use by Cloud Foundry, HTC, by and some others. Um, it was written in a weekend. Now, so the first version just had a Ruby server and a Ruby client, because Cloud Foundry originally was written in all Ruby. Uh, but the first version could do 150,000 messages a second. Compare and contrast that to maybe like a RabbitMQ, which probably does about 9,000, maybe 10,000 a second. Um, we rewrote both. Um, the client and uh, the server in Go. So Go is the language that is uh, the dominant language within App Server. It's a language out of Google. Um, if you haven't checked it out, I would definitely highly recommend it. Um, 
And the first pass where I modeled the architecture of the Ruby server into Go, I was at 500 some thousand messages a second. Uh, the current performance of it is about five to six million messages a second on this machine, this little MacBook Air, uh, which I'll show you in a second. I think there's a, I think I can get it to about eight um, in my copious free time, which does not exist. Uh, but I have all the stuff that I know what I can do. And Go helped out a lot too. It's, it's really matured uh, from one three to one four and then looking at one five. So this is um, courtesy of uh, Brave New Geek, where uh, Tyler Treat, I believe, did a dissecting of message cubes. And he ran um, the test and he immediately sent me an email. He says, it must be broken. You know, this, this isn't right. And, and so we talked back into the word thing. Um, he was really surprised at how fast it would go. And what I'm going to show you in a second is, is that this, right now, is one of the worst performing tests you can run on that. And I know that, and I have stuff that I'm going to try to actually make a lot faster. But if you look at like Ruby NAS was, you know, it was running probably about 700 or 77 thousand a second. Um, you see all the other ones, and again, the, the link is right there to the full article. Uh, but we do about 2 million or so um, per second. Um, and the receiver throughput is actually the same, where it sometimes seems to become massively imbalanced. Right? The publishers don't run the subscribers. So. I can give it a demo. Let's see if this works. Okay. So this, I don't know if you guys can see it. Uh, this is essentially just running a benchmark test within the, the GNSD repo on this box. Um, I don't know if it'll, how well it'll run, but we'll figure it out. So the first run, which again might be hard for you to see, it runs a publisher with no payload. So essentially, I'm just figuring out how much processing power the subject distributor and the framing and unframing event protocols are running inside the server. And it takes about 186 nanoseconds uh, per operation per cent. So that's about five point something million. I'd have to type it up in a, a math thing. As you can see, the, the big graph we had a second ago when it was a 4K payload, that's the worst. Right, we're at 47,000 plus 48,000 nanoseconds per operation. Again, I know, or I have an idea of how to fix it, uh, so I just have to get into it. Um, so that's pretty fast for a MacBook Air, right? You know, you're you're cranking along pretty pretty good, and I still think I can get it to about eight million or so. We'll have to see. In terms of, this is actually out on a cluster of on. DigitalOcean running, so I'm going to start with the server, that's how fast it starts. And then I'll run a benchmark. This is actually running the Go client, which is not very high performing yet. There's a lot of stuff I need to do there. But again, publish the speed is about 451 uh, operations per second. Pub sub is about 1541, meaning I send something and I receive it back. And then uh, publish speed by a channel, that's a Go uh, mechanism, is, is a little bit slower. Uh, actually, it's a little bit faster, sorry. So I actually did a full-blown presentation for GopherCon, the very first one uh, that was launched last year, on everything I did around optimizing the GNSD server. So I put the link in there if you guys want to check it out. It goes into massive, you know, graphs, no flame graphs, you know, like Brandon does, uh, does. But um, you know, it kind of talks about how we actually squeeze from 500,000 second to five or six million a second. So text base. Everyone who likes high performance says you never do anything in text. Um, I obviously disagree these days. It's easy to start with new clients. It really doesn't affect performance. Um, and you can tell that directly to a server. And it's amazing how approachable things are. I watched Salvatore, the guy that wrote Redis, do that for a client. They're like, well, what, are, you know, what language do you support for the clients? And he's like, well, watch this. And he just did it. Um, and so now, if you guys want, if you have it out there, I'll do it for us. We can just tell them to demo.nasa.io on port 4222. Let's see. Can you see that okay? Take it over there. So what's interesting there is that the very first thing I did was I hit enter, which was a protocol error, so it immediately chopped me off. Remember, it protects itself at all costs. But if we go in, I can do things like sub one. 
What that means is I want to subscribe to Foo and I give it a closure. Closure just means that the connection that it's talking to, it understands what one means. And whenever you match on something, send that message back to me and reference it as one. It could be anything, it doesn't matter. It's just a closure for each connection. And it says, okay, no problem. Now I can do hub to foo, two meaning how long the payload is. This is kind of like HTTP, so enter, okay, and enter. And so what happened was is it published a foo, it said okay, and all of a sudden there's a message foo. One, remember, is the closure, the subscription identifier, and two, which is the, the size of the payload. So now what I did was I said, and actually you didn't, I'm going to do it again because you can see it. So foo bar three. So that means subscribe to foo, join a bar group, right, which there's now already another member in there, and the subscription identifier again, it says the closure of this incrementing these is three. So now when I pub to foo two, actually let's do this already. Right. You see that we got two messages. One for was for one, one was for two. If I do this again, you know, that bar group is, is we're figuring out which one of those. There's only going to be one of them that gets it. Uh, two. So now all of a sudden it got only one. Oh, I know what I did. Actually, uh, did the auto printing stuff, which I'm going to show you guys in a second. So, how do you actually monitor these servers? Um, the monitoring is based on HTTP. It's modeled off of something that when I was at Google, everything inside of Google has a bar as the endpoint. Now you can only get to it from the inside, so you can't hit it uh, from the outside world. Um, and they already had uh, key value pairs, and we actually do JSON payloads. And so you can actually, again, curl against demo.nas.io. I'm actually going to start. Um, this process, which will actually is a NAS um, top version. So it's actually watching um, for people who actually connect with this thing. So if I do this again, you'll see that it now has a connection and they can watch it. <coughs> but on this one, if I say curl against demo.sio 822, which is the monitoring port on bar Z, yeah, it might be a little bit hard to see, but it essentially returns you know, an option structure around the max connections, the ping interval, which is a way to make sure TCP IP doesn't go dead on us, all different types of things. And it says how much memory it's using, how many cores it's using, the CPU, um, number of connections, routes, remotes, in messages, out messages, and all stuff. But you can also do CONZ, which if no one's connected to it, will return zero. But if someone starts connecting to it, you actually see detailed information about each connection on there as well. <laughs> so in terms of the clients, again, we have a Go client, um, Node.js, Java, Scala, Ruby, Python. We're going to be adding probably Lua and C and C++. Inside of AppServer, we actually have a C++ that's built directly into Nginx. So we actually can update Nginx routing tables on the fly at uh, ours are digitally signed and encrypted, which is the most uh, it cost to unravel, but about four or five hundred thousand times a second. So as things are moving around and you're trying to round figure out where it is, that's kind of how we actually achieve that. So we talked about the fact that it's clustered. Uh, it's full mesh one hop, meaning all of these servers are connected to one another. Now, that doesn't mean that they both have to know about each other, but there has to be a physical link in between. And the reason that it doesn't have to uh, require bidirectional is there could be an adding process in between the two. So I might be able to reach you, but you can't reach back to me. But once the connections, once the connections established, it's bidirectional. So of course, you know, the client connections are going to connect to one of the servers. And by default, unless you tell it otherwise, across all the clients, they randomly pick a server out of the server pool. So we just want a thousand, you know, of these clients. They would randomly kind of distribute themselves across the the server set. And of course, if this thing goes away, it immediately reconnects. The reconnect speed is usually about 10, 15 milliseconds or so. You know, as long as we can see the chop, if that makes sense. Hopefully it makes sense to each other. So 
Uh, when a socket goes away, sometimes you know, sometimes you don't. And so when we looked at the monitoring thing, you saw ping interval. The reason there's a ping interval is because if we don't know it went away, which in cloud platforms a lot of times that happens, anybody who's running AWS has probably experienced that, where a machine just goes away, but nobody that's connected to the socket thinks they did. That mechanism actually allows it to go away. And it can be instantiated or uh, initiated by the clients or the servers. The servers both do it. So the auto pruning part that we talked about earlier. Again, this is a big deal to me because of the patterns that, that we use quite a bit. Um, why? Well, again, if you're asking a request to reply where you want one answer, uh, but of a very large end, again, think Google. This does not very this does not work well at all on any of the existing messaging platforms that I know of. And so you're able to express a limited interest a priority. Uh, the system actually used across clustering as well, circuit breakers. And I actually can show you in the, the telnet session what this looks like. But essentially I can say subscribe to Foo, and I can say unsubscribe to Foo after one message, two messages, ten messages. And so that state is actually propagated throughout the cluster, but you're still receiving messages, right? It's just form a circuit breaker. But once you actually hit wherever that max is, it trips all the way across the cluster. And so your client library, actually, let's say you're you're sending out to 10,000 people and they're blitzing back as fast as they possibly can. You just want one answer. Your client library might see six, seven, maybe. Right, and that's easy for them to throw away. So it delivers the first one and throws the rest of them away. Most messaging platforms, you have to throw away all 10,000 on the client that actually did the request. So again, I don't know if anyone's seen these graphs, but you, know, you see these massive CPU spikes going along. It's easily accessible protocols, which I'll show you in just a second. Um, and all, all the clients that uh, we support, support it. It's, it's on by default in request reply. So remember, request reply is making no assumptions about who you're asking. So I could be simply sending it to Foo, and Foo could just be all of you, and you're all going to try to respond. It could be that I'm sending to Foo, but you all are part of a, of a group called ScaleX, you know, or Scale13X. I mean, only one of you is going to respond, and the system will do that. Or it could be a combination of both. It makes no assumptions on that. Actually, before I do that, I'll try to show you what I was talking about. So when I tell them that, I'm going to subscribe to Foo. <laughs> See, I didn't type it in right. I had to put the closure for the. Uh, Subscribe to Foo, subscription ID 1. Up to Foo, 2, send OK, I get it back. Now I'm going to do, let's do sub or unsub. We'll find out really quick because it'll fail up. Unsub 1, which is that subscription ID, after I receive one message. You know, I typed it wrong, it came out. I got it right. So now, what the system actually did was it set up a, a circuit breaker inside of the system. So I'm still active. The interest graph, uh, hopefully people get what I mean when I talk interest graph. So when I send a message, it's actually reverse traversing the interest graph. The interest graph flows towards me. Data flows in the reverse way towards the interest graph. Um, so now when I do a pub, foo, to, OK, I should get the message. Oh, foo. Actually, it didn't. Oh, it already sent. It already has one. Sorry. I'll do that again. Sub, foo, to, unsub, to, one. Uh, foo two, okay. Uh, foo two, okay. Nothing. Does that make sense? I, I, I know that kind of. So what happens is the circuit breaker and subscription state is is always known. And so what I mean by that is when I did the first sub and I sent the message to it, the system knew that it already received the message. When I said unsub oak okay, after one, it said, well, that's actually instantaneous. But the second pass through, if you notice, the first message got delivered, the second one did. Again, very low level, most people probably care less. At very, very large scale with that pattern of request reply where you don't know the audience, you care about it, at least you care about it. So in terms of, of the summary, uh, you know, NASA's model to be an always on dial time. It was inspired a little bit by how we think kind of the brain works. It doesn't do all of these things that these enterprise messaging systems do, right? just actually reacts. And, and hopefully those in the audience can understand the notion of 
like idempotent stage transitions or compensating transactional models. So idempotent means I can keep sending it as many times as I want and the state transition is always consistent on the other side. And that works great for that. Right? So in Cloud Foundry's original architecture and definitely in Continuum's architecture, we use PubSub, we use distributed queuing, we use that request reply of a large end pattern. Um, and the system is actually always kind of doing the, the right thing there. It's high performance. Uh, I can make it faster, but it's, it does pretty good itself. Um, it's clustered servers, and the clients are cluster aware without any additional external support from DNS or anything like that. And clients are in many languages, but I'd love to see more people contribute. Uh, again, that's is not going to be for everyone, and I'm okay with that. Some of the futures, um, again, there is inside of AppServa a direct C++ in the Nginx invented model, being able to directly plug in at high speed. And we're probably going to OSS that. We're pulling apart that low level stuff and then our identity and digital um, signatures and encryption uh, pieces. Um, there is a lot of performance gains I can still do in the server and, and the clients, um, which I hopefully get a little bit of spare time to, to work on. Um, We'll probably see a C, C++ client. Uh, I will probably model the C client after the high res clients that can use multiple eventing uh, libraries like libvb and libvb and uh, things like that. And Lua clients, a lot of people like Lua. It's very, very fast, very, very straightforward. I actually like it as well. Monitoring dashboards, so instead of that NAS top, you actually can kind of see something fancier there if you want. And then our configuration search. So if you're actually Trying to set up a full mesh one hop, uh, it, it's tedious, right? It would be really kind of nice to say, hey, here's a new server, and I have an API token, I want you to join the group that's represented by this API token. It automatically gets its config, starts up, and it does everything for you. You don't have to worry about any of that. Um, so, those are kind of some of the things that we're thinking about going forward. Thank you. Again, I, you know, it was twice as big as I thought the number of people would show out, and it's a very low level kind of. <coughs> Runchy topic, but it's, it's one that's near and dear to my heart. Um, here's some additional resources. NAS can be found at NAS.io. Um, here's the high performance uh, Go server. Um, oh, sorry, this is a Docker image. Yeah, there's a self contained, no operating system, a 6 meg big um, Docker image, uh, that I did, so, which was interesting. I was trying to impress upon myself and, and others that Docker, you know. It utilizes the kernel underneath, so you don't actually have to put a lot of stuff around it if you don't want to. And Go builds nearly completely static binaries, but if you trick it, you can. And so it's kind of interesting. If you go to GeneXD and look at kind of what we do to build this, it's kind of interesting. So I, I build it in, in terms of a larger OS inside of Docker. It downloads, you know, GeneXD compiles it, and then it trampolines again into itself into Docker on a scratch image, which nothing's there and copies just the absolute static execution to launch it there. So that's the only thing that's in there. That's kind of a neat trick, I thought. Um, and then the last link is just the really in the weeds descriptions of what we did to um, make the, the Go uh, server, the GNSD server, very, very high performance. So. Questions? Yeah, I, I got a question. So in your first use case for an app, you stopped that, right? And that was clearly made it really well in past The reason it was successful. It seems to me with the performance of it, this is more suited for the application center too, or for an appropriate or messaging or whatever system. Do you see more patches like in the world of Docker and what people are doing trying to do with and more orchestration? Do you see that playing out? Stronger in a kind of more pass like world, like it was in the boundary, or do you see it going more towards um, application, like as a relational like things like rather than people zero on two or whatever, or both? But uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts about building a pass and does it have an interesting play there? <coughs> so the question um, paraphrased down is it was originally kind of designed and architected for Cloud Foundry, where do you see its applicability in future passes or in other types of cloud or, or distributed platforms? Um, the notion of NAS was was a collection of ideas that I had before I built it for Cloud Foundry. So yes, it was that was kind of what forced me into actually writing the code. Uh, but the ideas have been percolating in my head for quite some time. Um, again, I built it for myself. Uh, I didn't expect anyone to care about using it. 
But if you look at the notion of applications that are using enterprise messaging systems, that's probably not the use case that you want. Um, however, the importance in distributed systems of a control plane. So OpenStack has one, Cloud Foundry has one, Continuum, I've shared Continuum has one. Lots of things have one. Amazon had one that famously wasn't working great when they first started out. They really done a lot of, of work there. That's probably a sweet spot. Now, that being said, if, if you're culturally building cloud applications like you know this wolf factor and all this other stuff, it might be applicable there, right? Because you're not making a lot of assumptions about what the messaging system can do. But it was originally built as a as a always on, very high performant, always accessible control plane mechanism for kind of modern distributed applications where we use item potent state transitions and compensating transactional models to actually modify you know the distributed state. Yes. How do you monitor performance in a production environment, both total throughput and percentage delivery? Yeah, so the, the question is how do you monitor the, the system in, in production? And um, in, in the presentation, we talked about that every single server has that RC endpoint on it that you can pull all of the statistics in real time from it. They can easily be aggregated. And of course, in, inside of AppServer, we have aggregation and fancier things. In the, uh, the open source GMAXD that we have there, those endpoints are there both for what we call VARZ, and then there's detailed information for every single connection. So you can actually pull VARZ and say, hey, there's a spike you know, in traffic all of a sudden. You can look at CONSI and they'll say, you guys are all okay. It's you, you know what I mean? That's the one there's a massive spike and you can look at it uh, that way. Yes? What about um, SSL wrapping into that? Is that? How do you handle that? Yeah, so the question is, is what about SSL wrapping? So the Ruby server, which still exists, I would recommend using it, but it does exist. Uh, had um, TLS baked into it, uh, but it was kind of broken. So it kind of gave you a false sense of security because of the way it dismissed certs and cert attribution. Um, Go, when we wrote, uh, wrote the Go server, uh, again, the, the work was prompted um, inside of AppSera, which was built on day one that every single message state transition, regardless of the plumbing, was going to be digitally signed and secured. So within AppSera's continuum model, everything is not you know, symmetrically encrypted. It actually is encrypted both on a class and instance basis of all the different actors within our system. 